Good morning and or whatever time of the day it may be for those folks joining us online. Again, I'm Kimberly Morse from Children's Hospital Los Angeles or CHLA. Welcome to our panel. Um, I do want to start by humbly saying I am not an expert in the areas of discussion yet. There are many in the CF community who have more experience and contributions to research. However, as a social worker from my diverse care, CF care center, and with great respect for the work that is being done, I'm honored to walk alongside pioneers, some in this very room, who are doing a lot to continue to advance in the areas of advocacy, access, and health equity in CF. After a brief review of the challenges faced, um, you'll find some of this data familiar as it's from those who have shared their findings generously. And then we will hear from some very strong voices. Thank you to CFRI and Siri for inviting me to share in this work that we are very passionate about. You've likely heard of her name if you don't recognize her photo. This is Dorothy H. Anderson, the physician and researcher who first discovered and named CF in 1938. This is a snapshot from her literature, as you may see outlined in the red, that acknowledges a wide racial distribution in CF that somehow becomes buried later. And many are working 85 years later to still challenge the perception amongst the public and medical practitioners that CF is a white disease. The education and advocacy continues. Unbalanced panels nationwide still exist. A misdiagnosis can be more likely depending on the state in which one is born. If you're born in Mississippi and don't have Delta F508, you'll be missed versus if you're born in New York State. If you're interested in some wonderful newborn screening studies about disparities in CF care, research doctors Megan McGarry, Susan, Susanna McCauley, and Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser, who I've been given permission to refer to as JTC. It goes without saying we are grateful for the game changer that is Trikafta. You can see the impact in the headlines here. However, we also grieve the dichotomy and sadness for those who cannot yet access Trikafta or any highly effective modulator therapy. You've likely heard of people speak of the 10% who are ineligible for modulator therapy. However, that percent is without consideration of race. This table here is adapted from two different presentations. The percentage of people who have no copy of Delta F508 is broken down by ethnic ancestry. So while it is 10% in the white population, in the Asian, Black, and Hispanic populations, we're looking at 30 to 40% of uneligibility. To exemplify this further, I wanted to share about seven patients at Children's Hospital. Why did I pick these seven? Well, these were the seven patients who happened to be admitted when I made this slide two weeks ago. Note, all seven inpatients are children of color. The patient's name, mutations, uh, identified ethnic um, backgrounds, eligibility for modulators, as well as research participation are noted here. Two were camera shy. This slide, I think, really highlights the reality of modulator ineligibility. However, it also highlights the opportunities we have to address health equity in CF and to be inclusive of education and research recruitment at CHLA. There are five out of seven who are ineligible for Trikafta, yet four out of those five have still had the opportunity to participate in research. Since creating this slide, we've had four more admissions notably all people of color. Three of those four are modulator ineligible. One had her lung transplant about two years ago. There is one, however, who is modulator eligible, thankfully. I will note that she just recently immigrated to the US from her home country in South Asia, where she does not have access to modulator therapy. This slide from a 2016 article speaks volumes. The BIPOC community's lower eligibility for modulators parallels lower inclusion in clinical trials. Many of you in this room or online 
are working to change this, including our hospital, CHLA. Here are some recent publications from 2018 to 2024, noting differences in diagnosis, treatment, and health outcomes amongst diverse communities within the US and other countries, noted the UK, South Africa, and Canada. I think it goes without saying that access to therapies is an issue for the global CF community. On a hopeful note, there are many in this very room or online who are fierce advocates, advocating for equity in screening, research, and treatment. Many of you likely know or recognize the doctor or the couple mentioned in two of these headlines. Why? Because you're paying attention. You are aware you're educating yourself and educating others. The doctor who created the tool is JTC. The couple is Terry and Michelle Wright working towards health equity. There is great hope throughout uh, CFRI's mission to be a global resource for the CF community. And that includes raising awareness and embracing racial and ethnic differences and diversity. This panel, similar forums, creation of the printed info, films, podcasts in various languages, including this conference, where there's available captioning and subtitles, is all with a purpose to serve a diverse audience. That is hope. Here are more resources, including information in Spanish and Hindi languages. There's a great amount of online bilingual content, as Siri mentioned, on the YouTube, YouTube channel, including captioning, subtitles, it goes on. CFRI has an active diversity and inclusion advisory committee. Some members are here or speaking today. They are the hope. I believe that my center, CHLA, is part of that hope. I want to shout out to my research team, including our coordinator and NP, Carmen Reyes, who's here with our young adult, Nayeli. This photo and headline are from our CHLA website. However, Nayeli and her family also made a video that they contributed to a 2022 NACFC um, session entitled Recruiting a Diverse Population for Clinical Research. JTC was there. And this looked at strategies and ways to gain trust within diverse communities, including the Latinx and Hispanic community. Some takeaways were the importance of diverse research team members and providers, including those like Carmen Reyes, and sharing strategies amongst care centers. 30% of our patients at CHLA are modulator ineligible, including Nayeli here, who identifies as Latinx Hispanic, I think that's covered up, yet she is participating in research. Nayeli is bilingual in Spanish and English, though her father prefers Spanish language. So at our center, in addition to Spanish, we have found Bengali, Arabic, Russian, and most recently Urdu to be preferred languages of at least one parent at our center. Here are some Latino-focused partnerships and programs, including the Center for Latinos with CF, directed by Dr. Megan McGarry, who are working to advance the field of health disparities. We also have the partnership and awareness campaign between the Banel Foundation and Genentech. We are the extended CF family, or Somos la Gran Familia CFECU. They're doing work to help close the health equity gap. There is hope in the African-American and Black CF community. If you don't recognize the man on the left, I hope you do. Please research him. His name is Terry Wright and he's the founding president of the North American, North, I'm sorry, the National Organization of African Americans with CF. He's taught us many things, including the lesson of the importance of health providers recognizing their own racial bias. We have Rachel on our right, who you also see in the screen, who is part of that organization and will share her story. The headline here, um, you'll learn about her struggles and triumph and you'll find out who that Colorado specialist is. So while there are evident gaps in care, we educate ourselves and others. You're here today, you've been here this weekend, you've been in past conferences, you'll learn in the future as well. But we put that knowledge into action 
through intentionality and identifying and recruiting CF care team members, research participants, community member leaders from diverse backgrounds. You are a part of this action and hope today. We will now give our attention to some strong voices who will share their lived experiences. I would like to introduce Jalen Cooper. And Jalen, um, you can just let me know when you would like to advance the slides. Hello, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Hi, thank you. My name is um, Jalen Cooper. Uh, I want to th give everyone a thanks just for allowing me to have the opportunity to speak this morning um, about cystic fibrosis and to share my experience. Um, and yes, so thank you. Um, you can go to the next slide, sorry. <laughs> So I just want to start with just um, from the beginning, just to tell everyone just how my diagnosis story happened. Um, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at 18 months years old. Um, my mother, as she was taking care of me, she recognized, of course, all of the symptoms with cystic fibrosis. I presented everything just from, um, of course, the salty skin sweat. Um, I wasn't able to keep much food down. Um, having a lot of belly aches, things like that. And so, of course, she spent a lot of time, you know, going back and forth to the emergency room, just trying to find an answer. And so with that, she faced definitely an uphill battle because despite the symptoms um, and trying to get help from the medical professionals, um, they initially, of course, looked over my CF as a result from just the color of my skin. And so with that, um, they basically went with that assumption. However, my mother, she knew just something wasn't quite right. And so it ended up leading to her to reaching out to get a second opinion from a gastroenterologist. Um, as, I nat as we know that CF naturally has issues with gastro issues. And so therefore, she went to this doctor. And so after she examined me, she told my mother, to go back to my primary care physician and demand that they tested me for cystic fibrosis. And so long and behold, uh, it, in fact it was, and so therefore it at least granted her at least some peace because now after this long 18 months, she finally found an answer. However, of course, um, as we know, cystic fibrosis is a lifelong fight. And so therefore we still uh, endured many challenges because of it. Um, Luckily, because of her, which is where I feel like I draw my strength from, um, because she was so relentless, she demanded and she wa wanted to assure that we had an answer. And so her self-advocacy is what inspires me in order to be able to advocate for not only just for myself, but for other people with cystic fibrosis. And so therefore, that's one of the reasons why, I, of course, wanted to get involved with helping to increase the mission of finding a cure for CF. Um, and even with that, we still endured a lot of struggles. Um, of course, I've been through several hospitalizations over the course of my life. And of course, you know, of course, many other uh, emergency room visits. And we still faced a lot of issues um, dealing with some health healthcare staff. Um, and I can recall uh, for one, one time where my mother, um, she was in the room and of course we had a doctor that came in and they actually um, unfortunately questioned the paternity of my father who was who is African-American and so therefore um, they were just in disbelief that you, you could have a black child with cystic fibrosis. Um, Another time I can recall is a time where I was in the hospital and there were a group of doctors there, um, which I can remember maybe five or six, five or six of them um, surrounding my bed. And of course, at that time, of course, it was very scary um, as I'm laying here and, you know, I'm very sick and, you know, I'm, it almost felt as if I was um, a, a spectacle almost. And it was just everyone, of course, wanted to come and just see who this child was um, with cystic fibrosis. And so with that, I just, I don't think I understood at the time why it was such a huge deal. But I think as I got older, I realized that, you know, this is something that needs to, of course, be talked about in order to reduce um, things and just to be able to understand that, you know, um, it's not always just about the book cover. Um, 
another thing that I wanted to talk about, of course, was just, I can only imagine just being, well, I imagine being in a high stress situation and, you know, of course, I can't imagine just someone who may not have had the strength that I had and my mother in order to advocate for themselves. Um, of course, we go to the hospital to rely on our healthcare um, staff, um, our nurses, our doctors, our respiratory therapists in order to navigate these difficult moments for us. Um, in order to, of course, provide us with the right diagnosis and, of course, the compassionate care with empathy and understanding. Um, and when such assumptions and biases are made with these sort of, sorts of things, of course, it interferes with the trust that we have for our hospital system. And we want to be able to trust them because we want to get better. Um, however, it's just those type of things can get in the way of that. Um, and it, it, of course, overall impacts the person's health and it undermines the fundamental role of our healthcare professionals. Um, we also place a great deal of our trust in our medical professionals to act with integrity and competence. And so therefore it's crucial that the trust factor is upheld while ensuring that every patient is treated with the utmost respect and consideration, uh, regardless of no matter where their background comes from. Um, of course, with this, considering all things, I look at it as a way, of course, everything with CF, especially with mutations, comes down to genetics, of course. And so, therefore, the diagnosis should be based on, of course, the thorough investigation of the individual cases and the individual patient um, while being able to assess their symptoms uh, rather than assumptions based on, of course, our outward characteristics. Um, genetics, of course, is a field that encompasses a many array of conditions and variations that rely m much more on just the book cover, which is the person's race or appearance. Um, and it can lead to the, of course, in many cases before the misdiagnosis and the inadequate care of a CF patient. Um, instead of healthcare professionals, uh, we should be able to assure that we're, of course, using science in order to confirm um, some of these things. And of course, being able to assure that the patient receives the personalized care and the accurate evaluation. So therefore, I look at it as, I look at my experience as a conversation to reveal two critical issues. And the first one, of course, is being able to address um, any sort of bias and misconceptions as it relates to cystic fibrosis in the healthcare setting. And of course, the continued need in order to discuss cultural competence within the healthcare system. Um, of course, I believe it's crucial that for our healthcare professionals to rely not just on science, but and um, and not on preconceived notions. And I believe that our medical training should include um, very many reg rigorous education, continuing education um, sessions on cultural competence in order to achieve the goal of dismantling biases and improve patient outcomes within the healthcare system. Um, and by focusing on overall just authenticity and empathy and understanding within the within the healthcare setting. So that way we can better provide um, quality healthcare services to our patients, regardless of their background. So therefore, I think that this, of course, is a great opportunity and a great platform in order to have those conversations and encourage open dialogue in order to advance our healthcare, our healthcare quality and and mission. So, therefore, of course, I want to, of course, be a part of this mission in order to help others and and future people with who will be born with cystic fibrosis until the research is done in order to continue in order to cure cystic fibrosis and of course to be able to advance care such as new new research and new medications in order to help so. thank you Jalen and we'll have some time for questions for her after the panelists have gone 
I did want to mention that she's a 28 year old native of Little Rock, Arkansas. And she had shared that her journey with CF has taught her the importance of speaking up and advocating for herself, as we can see. She hopes that one day every person with CF will receive the utmost respect, quality care, and understanding, which is why she is actively participating in the mission to find a cure. Jalen also serves on CFRI's CF Adult Advisory Committee. And thank you for speaking today and stick around for questions. Thank you, Jalen. Next, I would like to introduce Alicia Maciel. Alicia is the mother of two young adult sons, one of whom was diagnosed with CF at the age of six. Alicia is a certified leadership coach and mindfulness mentor who specializes in supporting others to build resilience and cultivate well being. She is a leading member of the CF Research Institute's Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the Embrace Mothers Retreat Planning Committee. I believe she also won an award last night as well. <laughs> yes. She edits and translates CFRI's written resources and videos to Spanish. Please welcome Alicia. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to share a bit about uh, our diagnosis story and just our experience uh, on this journey of cystic fibrosis. Um, this picture, as you can see here, uh, it's my husband, Peter, myself, and our youngest son, Mark Anthony, who is sitting in between my husband and me, and our oldest son, Peter, who is just a year and a half older than Mark Anthony. And I, this is a very significant photo because it was taken a month before Mark Anthony turned six and was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. So he was born before newborn screening. And um, when he was diagnosed, it was a brand new um, awareness for us. We had never heard of cystic fibrosis. And so it was a journey unlike that of many who hear about cystic fibrosis for the very first time. That was very scary. Uh, it felt very lonely. And it was time to begin to navigate it. Just fast forwarding to um, 2020, this is a picture of Mark Anthony graduating high school. And he graduated during the pandemic. So this is literally a stage photo. <laughs> <laughs> where we drove by, he got off from the car, he got on this, you know, um, little stage they had there, took the photo, and we drove back home, and that was graduation. <laughs> and so, like many other young um, individuals, Mark Anthony has had to navigate not only cystic fibrosis, but a pandemic and, you know, being flexible. So there's a lot in our kids' lives. Um, but we're very proud of him because in spite of all of the challenges, he is still committed to um, moving forward and doing well. And so the journey here, if you wouldn't know, um, you know, he, he has been a very active, um, living a very um, active life, healthy life in many ways. Uh, here he is um, just canoeing or, or um, kayaking down the Colorado River. He was the Boy Scout and um, was able to make it to Eagle Scout with the love and support of my husband, who was Scout Master for five years. So very active life. Um, here's Mark Anthony. Just a month ago, uh, he went to Japan with friends for two weeks. So, of course, you know, with the support of the medical team and all of us trying to figure out how can we equip you with your medications and your equipment. So um, if you need uh, medical care while you're in Japan, you're going to be OK. So the whole point of these pictures is that we still try to keep moving forward as we're also navigating this disease. And um we rely heavily on the support of our care team um, to support us through this experience. And being of Hispanic descent, um, as I mentioned last night, we are me a Mexican family. The boys were born in this country, but oftentimes um, it was hard. And I believe that part of the reason why he was not diagnosed sooner 
is because no one in the medical community thought that Mark Anthony's symptoms could be uh, associated with cystic fibrosis, even though now in retrospect, they're all clear symptoms of cystic fibrosis, such as issues with the digestive tract, severe constipation. He was in the hospital every year, once a year with severe constipation. Um, they thought he had asthma, so he also presented problems with the lungs. But no one really thought, oh, this might be cystic fibrosis, again, because we are a Hispanic family and this disease was thought to be um, Caucasian. And so here we suffered the impact of misinformation, ignorance, and perhaps, you know, unconscious bias. And um, that is why I sit on this panel today to bring awareness and in our experience, we've been very fortunate. Mark Anthony received uh, the bulk of his pediatric care at Children's Hospital of Orange County. I became very active in the uh, parent advisory committee to be a part of the conversation around how we can provide better, better medical care for the um, patients and their families so that we could achieve better outcomes, because that's really our common ground, right? How can we truly make a difference um, in the care and the quality of life that the patients are receiving? And so um, I felt very fortunate to be able to bring in our point of view and our experience as a family. And um, some of the things that I noticed that we could do better um, as medical care providers is perhaps be more curious about meeting and getting to know the families where they are before we start providing um, the the care um, uh, directives or um, regimens that have been proven to lead to better outcomes. Yes, they are there and they're very valuable, but I think what really matters is that we slow down a little bit to really get curious and connect with the, the patient and the family as human beings, as individuals. Um, it, it's helpful when we're talking to the dietitian and they come in with their whole list of best practices and recommendations for what's gonna help Mark Anthony. If the dietitian first gets to know Mark Anthony and is curious about what type of food he likes, what type of food he eats, uh, what he enjoys, um, and then maybe build on that toward the recommendations. So it's important to uh, create a space and an environment where the patient and the family feel seen, heard, valued, uh, cared for, included. And then let's talk about what are the best recommendations in CF care, because of course those are important. And what we're really talking about is quality care, excellent care, and truly um, doing what we must do to receive or achieve the best outcomes. Can you imagine a gardener treating every single plant exactly the same? That would not work. Every plant is unique. Uh, every plant has different characteristics. And a great gardener begins by understanding that. Not because they're being nice, not because they're being kind, but because that is what excellent gardening is about. And I kind of relate that to our experience. You know, we're not here asking, oh, be nice to us, um, make an exception for us, see us any different. What we're really talking about is how can you engage us two very critical stakeholders in the research around what leads to better outcomes, the parents, the family, the patient, so that together we do our best at executing excellent medical care. And so this you know, webinar could have easily been titled Critical Factors to Quality, quality Care and excellent outcomes. And so it's very important that we continue to talk about these factors that um, are gonna help us all really 
move the needle on this disease and hopefully get closer to a cure because the more we learn about the diverse populations, the more data points we collect and the more informed we can be about developing better treatments and care that are really gonna help us achieve the, the goals. Thank you for sharing, Alicia. I now want to introduce Api Turumula. He is a 22-year-old CF patient with a nonsense mutation living in the Bay Area. Abi graduated from Santa Clara University last spring with a BS in neuroscience and just finished his year-long service term with the National Health Corps San Francisco. Abi has, was diagnosed at the age of three and has an older brother who also has CF. His brother was diagnosed at the age of five. Abi hopes to be able to help increase South Asian representation and awareness within the CF community. And he wants to advocate for the importance of diversity and clinical trials. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Kim, for introducing me. And, you know, thank you for everyone for on the panel for being able to share their experiences. You know, it's really, really wonderful to hear all of your stories about cystic fibrosis and the, you know, the increased need for diversity and representation within the community. Um, and I first of all want to thank, you know, CFRI for giving me the opportunity to be able to share my experience with cystic fibrosis. Um, you know, as Kim mentioned, I was diagnosed at the age of three. Um, for my family, I have an older brother, you know, he's around 28, and he was diagnosed at the age of five. Um, based on speaking to my parents, you know, when he was young, around the age of five or so, um, he was having a lot of digestive issues and, you know, kind of through the help of their, you know, his pediatrician, they were able to get referred to Stanford. And after extensive testing, you know, he was diagnosed with CF and obviously with the genetic component, I was also, um, you know, tested as well. And I was diagnosed at the age of three. Um, and when I was a child, I feel like my CF, you know, didn't affect me too much. I was still able to lead a pretty active life and was able to do a lot. But I think kind of starting around in high school, um, was when I really started to experience the pain of being hospitalized. Um, I feel like ever since kind of the beginning of high school, I've been hospitalized pretty much every year on average for around 10 to 14 days, um, with one of those days being almost a month. And, you know, obviously it's it's affected my life a lot more over the last five to seven years. And I think, you know, it just kind of seeing the wonderful work that's being done on the advocacy end, um, it has definitely inspired me to want to play a more active role in the CF community. Um, you know, as, as Kim mentioned, I'm interested in wanting to become a physician in the future, and I'm really interested in science. And, you know, definitely my um, experiences with CF have definitely contributed to my career interests and, you know, wanting to be a doctor in the future. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, definitely have had an increase in the interest of wanting to play more advocacy in the, in the, um, in the community. And, you know, especially with my my mom kind of introduced me to CFRI. She was working with Siri and wanting to increase diversity within the Asian community just because, you know, when my my brother was diagnosed and when then when I was diagnosed, my my parents had never really heard about cystic fibrosis before and it came to a big shock um to them. And you know, historically CF has always been kind of painted as a sort of, you know, like white disease and it's not really been known to be seen too much in the Asian community, but as Obviously, research has shown, you know, it affects, it's a global disease and it affects people of all backgrounds. Um, you know, and just today speaking, I'm I'm mostly speaking from my personal experience today. I've, I've had to do some research, but, you know, mostly just speaking about my kind of journey with CF. But whenever I've thought about CF, I've never, to be honest, I've, I've not seen too much from my personal experience, um, people who kind of were looking like me, you know, other South Asians. Um, but obviously, as research has shown within the Asian community, you know, a lot like South Asians do make up a large proportion of, you know, cystic fibrosis patients within the Asian American community. And I think it's really important when we talk about the Asian American community to obviously, you know, understand that there's a lot of diversity and it's important to kind of disaggregate that data um, and to look at, you know, different, you know, subgroups of people to really understand how the disease affects everyone. Um, and so, you know, for myself, I, you know, in my personal experience, I've not interacted with too many South Asian patients with cystic fibrosis, but, you know, as I've heard over time, I've even at my, you know, clinic at Stanford, I've seen more South Asian patients and I've seen, you know, more parents wanting to be involved and just kind of knowing how my, you know, parents didn't know much about it. I'm sure that there's other parents that also don't know much about the disease. And, you know, I can imagine how scary that is being a new parent and having their kid, you know, diagnosed with CF. And so, 
you know, I just really wanted to be able to create more awareness and create more or increase more representation um, within the South Asian community, specifically, you know, when, when it comes to CF, just to, you know, tell everyone that, you know, just to know more about how to navigate that, because obviously CF has played, um, you know, has affected my life in a large way. Um, and specifically now, I think as I'm entering the workforce and wanting to figure out what I want to do and also just have an active life in my 20s and seeing a lot of my peers who don't have CF being able to lead you know, kind of fulfilling and productive lives. For myself, this year has been really difficult as I've been in and out of the hospital, you know, multiple times with different episodes of, you know, homophysis and other sorts of things. And, you know, I just really wanted to be able to share my story and kind of, you know, connect with other people in the community just to, you know, increase um, awareness of, of cystic fibrosis. Um, and, you know, just to kind of some background on myself as well, I'm not eligible for modulator therapies and, you know, just kind of hearing the introduction that Kimberly had given earlier about, you know, the data, you know, it was really alarming to see how BIPOC individuals with CF, you know, many of us, you know, don't have copies of the Delta 508. And so that makes a lot of us, you know, ineligible for modulator therapy. And, you know, it is really important to obviously increase, you know, that access to modulator therapies um, for people that don't obviously have Delta 508, just because, you know, seeing the benefits of it, of people that do, you know, that are eligible for it and seeing how their, you know, their lives have changed so much. I definitely want the rest of us to also be able to benefit from that. And, you know, it's it's important to see that research kind of growing. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with organizations like Emily's Entourage and had the opportunity to speak at an FDA listening session. You know, that was actually one of my first ever advocacy events. And it was really, really powerful just to speak with other CF patients and kind of hear their stories just because I think CF can be a very isolating kind of disease, you know, not being able to interact with other individuals with CF. And personally, I haven't known anyone, you know, within my inner circle that had CF outside of my brother. And so I, a lot of times growing up, I felt very, very alone. Um, and so, you know, I think just being able to hear everyone come to, you know, at these conferences, which has just been so amazing to see everyone come together and talk about this disease and wanting to find a cure, you know, it's just really powerful for me. And it just, it's just amazing to see how everyone is just wanting to come together and, and find a cure and just kind of support one another just because, you know, there, CF can be a very burdensome disease and can be very, very overwhelming and exhausting. Um, but I think as the data has shown, you know, it's really important to increase diversity on clinical trials. As I've mentioned before, and as others have mentioned, CF does affect many, you know, people of all backgrounds of all racial groups. And so it is really important to have everyone kind of represent, represented in these clinical trials so that we can, you know, have more data to understand, you know, how the disease affects everyone. And I think it's important for everyone to also get the care that they deserve and, you know, increase genetic testing as well, you know, with the newborn screenings and, and seeing, you know, the, the, I, I was trying to look for the slide specifically, but seeing, you know, the, the panel variants that were, you know, tested and seeing how some states only test for one variant while others are able to test for a lot more. It's really important to just increase that overall so that we don't have any mis, you know, diagnoses going forward and everyone get the care that they deserve. Um, and so, yeah, what I would like to say kind of on a final note is that it is really important to have increased diversity in these clinical trials. You know, it's important for everyone to get the care that they deserve and that they need. And I'm very grateful for the care that I've received at Stanford. And, you know, I know my parents are definitely very grateful as well. And, um, you know, I think it's really important going forward for clinical trials to have people of all backgrounds um, be represented just so that we know, you know, how the disease affects everyone and, you know, kind of being able to, you know, reduce those disparities that we, you know, have seen and, you know, kind of avoid that going forward. And so, yeah, thank you so much for, you know, listening to, you know, to my, my story. And, you know, I, I, it's been really amazing being able to work with CFR and I hope to kind of carry that into the future. But thank you so much. Thank you for sharing, Avi. Our final panelist is Rachel Alder. Rachel is a young woman with CF from Salt Lake City, Utah. Ray was diagnosed with CF in January 2023 at the age of 26, overcoming racial bias, health disparity, and rapid health deterioration. She is a fierce advocate and has been since her early childhood years. Ray serves on the board of directors of the Utah Pride Center, as well as the Bonnell Foundation Board. Thank you, Ray. Hello. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be with this incredible group of panelists and, and share a little bit more of, of each of our stories with you today. Um, I am going to have you skip forward a couple of slides, if that's okay. 
So as far as my early years with CF, um, thank you. <laughs> as far as my early years with um, with CF and and symptoms, I began having issues mostly with with joint pain, digestive issues, inability to gain weight, and repeat both sinus and respiratory type infections that took a very long time to be able to heal from. And uh, I, growing up, I, I ended up getting involved quite heavily in athletics and kind of found my home in the pool with swimming and water polo. Um, but one of the things that did hinder me a lot in, in that process was what we thought to be uh, asthma as I was diagnosed, as well as exercise-induced um, asthma. So the, the swimming and water polo definitely, uh, I think, helped me with, with the cystic fibrosis that we didn't know I had at the time, but also kind of stirred up a lot of issues with my lungs during that time and, and made it quite difficult for me to, to breathe at that level of exertion. Um, we can skip to the next slide. So growing up, um, I was I was adopted and did not have really any genetic or family history growing up. And we didn't know the significance of that at the time, but it, it will come into play into my, my story here in a moment. But um, as I reached college, I was able to play water polo and swim in college for a year and kind of lived out my dream year, but my, my digestive issues as well as uh, the, the infections became too much for me to be able to continue to compete at such a high level. Unfortunately, I was, um, later misdiagnosed with with what we thought to be lupus at the time and rheumatoid arthritis. And I spent a lot of time on some pretty heavy medications that tended to make me even even more sick, unfortunately, and and really led to quite an intense cycle of hospitalizations, infection, lung damage, and and repeat and rinse and repeat the cycle all over again. And um, it was a really difficult time with my health. I was fortunately able to get into Mayo Clinic in 2020, um, right after I had COVID for the first time, which hit me incredibly hard with with pneumonia and and caused quite quite some damage to my lungs as well. Um, during that time, uh, like I said, I was able to get into Mayo Clinic. They were able to formally rule out lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, any autoimmune etiology as as what was causing my symptoms, which was helpful in some areas, but led to more questions than than answers than others. And um, fortunately, at the time, I was also able to meet members of my biological family and get more genetic family history, which included several of my, my first cousins having cystic fibrosis, which was really my first intro into the world of, of CF. I didn't know much about it. I didn't think much about it when I, when I learned about it at the time, um, just others. You know, that's that's just something to note in my family history. And I knew that down the road I, I wanted to have kids and maybe needed to be tested to see if I was the carrier. But that was that was the only significance that it held to me at the time. Um, as I continued in this in this health journey, thinking, not even realizing that there would be any correlation. Um, so after that, we can skip to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as I as I continued this cycle of repeat hospitalizations, I was eventually diagnosed with bronchiectasis and referred to the local uh, CF bronchiectasis center and was able to get a little bit more information, but still no answers as to why I would have something like bronchiectasis at uh, 25 years old. There was really no um, understanding or great explanation for that. I was reassured that it couldn't possibly be CF. Um, there was a bunch of different factors, my age being one of them, race, ethnicity being another um, consideration as well as to why CF was was not likely. I also was able to, with the family history information, get genetic testing done through Mayo Clinic to see if I was a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And to uh, our complete surprise, my, my test came back not only as having one mutation of CF, but having two mutations. And I didn't even know that having CF was a, was a possibility at the time. I knew that was something that was usually diagnosed in, in infants and didn't understand that the likelihood of that meant that, that CF was, was involved. I thought that I was still just possibly a carrier and, 
and was reassured over and over that again, even with the genetic information we had, CF was unlikely due to one of my mutations being so rare and unknown that the significance of it is, is considered uncertain. And the other one is classified as, as pathogenic or causing CF. So we, we just really were kind of stuck in this gray zone for several years while I continue that cycle of, of deconditioning and lung damage and, and hospitalizations. Um, but in my gut, I definitely knew that there was more to the story there, especially the more I started to research and learn about cystic fibrosis on my own. I was able to join a few groups on on social media and, and various platforms to try and learn more about it and the diagnostic process and and trying to understand misdiagnosis and CF and how common that actually was. And the more I learned, the more certain I became that that was likely the the path that we were possibly looking at. Um, so as things continued to progress, I knew that if the trajectory that I was on continued, that that things were not going to end well for me. And I was gravely concerned for the the future of my health and, and my lungs. So out of um, really just sheer de desperation, I was able to reach out through social media to one of those groups that I was part of. And um, thank heaven to God to the, the right places and the right people. Uh, I was able to be connected with uh, Dr. Michelle and Terry Wright through through this post, who were more than helpful and dropped everything to get in touch with me immediately that same day and give me as much information as they possibly could, not only about uh, their organization, the National Organization of African Americans with CF or NOSF, but also about Terry's story and his own journey with late diagnosis and and how certain factors uh, hindered him from his diagnosis until until much later. And they were able to get me the information that I needed to know where to where to really head with this because I just felt like I wasn't really getting the answers I needed locally. And um, they were able to connect me and recommend me to uh, do everything that I could to get to one place and to see one person. And that was to National Jewish Health and to see Dr. Taylor Gowser. So we we packed up and and drove to the the soonest appointment that we could get out at National Jewish and I was able to get a, a nasal potential difference test. And in that very same day of just one clinic visit and one test, I was able to receive a formalized diagnosis of cystic fibrosis just over a year and a half ago at the age of 26 years old. And I'm incredibly grateful for the components of, of self-advocacy and, and collective advocacy as well in our community, because it's it's through both of those methods that that I was really able to get my diagnosis of cystic fibrosis and and figure out what we were really looking at and be able to kind of find the missing puzzle piece that really made all of my health issues from from birth make a lot more sense to myself as well as my family. Um, and really since then I've I've always been an advocate throughout my life, but it just further fueled my my fire for advocacy and self-advocacy because if if that component hadn't already been so instilled in me and in my life, I, I again I, I don't know where my life and my health would be right now. I don't I don't like to think about it too much, and it's it's something that I'm very grateful for that was instilled in me, but that that I hope to be able to encourage to instill in others in our community because it's such a vital aspect of getting a equitable care and and access to opportunities like participating in, in clinical trials and getting better information about rare mutations like like the one I have so that others hopefully in the future don't have to go through these diagnostic processes and and fall into these loopholes and these and these these gaps in our system that that shouldn't take social media to, to get a diagnosis and and hopefully we can we can work towards uh, that better more equitable care regardless of where you live or what centers near you and what what means and access you have to to those. So that's my goal in advocacy is to really just educate of the importance of of that self advocate component as well as as well as group advocacy to advocate for each other and to be able to step in where where those gaps in the system are and how we can collectively work to bridge those gaps together with our medical community and team that is so vital to our care. Um, so all in all, I'm just incredibly grateful to be here and in the right place with the right team and the right diagnosis and and the damage, you know, of the the first 26 years that that can't necessarily be undone and and really it, it should have never happened. But gen you know, genetics are genetics and and CF was inevitable, but what wasn't inevitable was 
was dismissal and and the fact that you know I spent so many years of my life undiagnosed and so now I, I just hope to work together with the community and continue to work with opportunities like this to make sure that that isn't happening to anyone in the future and I continue to travel out of state to get my my main CF care and and that's something that I hope to be able to improve in the future as well and we're just needing better better advocacy, better um, opportunities to have our voices heard. It's vital that we hear these voices in in our clinic visits, in foundations, in conferences as well. And it and it shouldn't, like I said, take turning to social media to get a diagnosis. I'm grateful that it's there. It will always be part of my story. But I want to fight for more equitable diagnostic and and comprehensive cystic fibrosis care. And and that's a big part of my crusade. And I hope that we can we can do that together because I firmly believe that everyone deserves more tomorrows. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. I wanted to add that Ray is also on the CF Foundation Adult Advisory Council and CFRI's Adult Advisory Committee. So we have heard from some very strong and powerful voices. We definitely have some fierce advocates on this panel. And I'm so grateful for everyone sharing today. We are at time, however. Um, so I've been informed that our panelists, um, Alicia, Ray, Jalen, and Avi will be available at a, f a future virtual forum um, to so you can ask more insightful questions and dig a little bit deeper into their journeys. Thank you so much for being here today.